Thank you all for taking the time to join us this afternoon for this very important and timely topic. Being an immigrant myself, this one is very close indeed to my own heart. As employers across the nation struggle to fill open positions, how can immigration help? What policy changes have taken place recently to make it easier to hire immigrants? And how does the whole process work? We will attempt to delve into these questions and more this afternoon. So just a few housekeeping rules before we begin. You will be muted for the duration of the presentation. However, if you wish to ask questions, please do so via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. And we will do our best to get to as many of those as possible. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our panelists for today's event. Betsy Cohen is, of course, my dear colleague and the executive director of the St. Louis Mosaic Project, a program of the World Trade Center within the St. Louis Economic Development Partnership. Betsy had a prior career at Nestle Purina as vice president of marketing and is a graduate of Wellesley College and the Harvard Business School. She is on the advisory board for the SLU Schaefer School of Business and the Cortex Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee. The St. Louis Mosaic Project has two goals, to have the St. Louis region become the fastest growing major metropolitan region for foreign born and to add 25,000 foreign born to the region by 2025. This attraction and retention is done through collaboration with hundreds of local organizations and ways to support international people of all ethnicities through universities, corporations, culture, faith, K through 12 schools, immigration agencies, and government entities. The Mosaic Project has programs for professional connections to help with career networks for job seekers. Programs include those for international students, corporations, and organizations looking to have more diverse hiring, the International Women's Spouse Group, the International Women's Mentoring Program, local individual ambassadors and ambassador schools. The Mosaic Project also gives government advice to our city, county and surrounding governmental bodies. Welcome, Betsy. Thank you. And secondly, Nalini. Nalini Mahadevan is the principal attorney with MLO Law LLC and has been in practice since 2003, specializing in immigration, estate planning and special needs. Her clientele includes both corporate employers and individuals. Nalini's law practice is MBE, WBE and WOSB certified and was recently certified with the Women's Business Enterprise National Council. MLO Law LLC is headquartered in St. Louis with offices in Chicago and Atlanta. Nalini's career started off as a corporate lawyer in India before relocating to the United States. She holds an undergraduate degree in accounting, a master's degree in law from the University of Mumbai, India, an MBA from Washington University in St. Louis, and a JD from St. Louis University School of Law. I'm getting tired just thinking about that, Nalini, let alone um, having had all How these qualifications. for punishment. <laughs> you are indeed. <laughs> She's currently an older woman, in case she wasn't busy enough, currently an older woman in the City Council of Frontenac and a division chair of the specialty bar for the Missouri Bar. She's on the board of Focus St. Louis and the American General Contractors of Missouri. Nalini is extensively engaged in community development and volunteers her time as an advisor to several local nonprofits from the Indian community in the region. A founding member of the South Asian Bar Association of Metropolitan St. Louis, Nalini is also a mentor with SCORE. As a migrant, woman, and a businesswoman, she understands the challenges that entrepreneurs have when starting a business. She is a well-respected attorney and a frequent speaker for the Missouri Bar and Bar Association of Metropolitan St. Louis, minority business and women owners groups. All right, so welcome, Nalini. Thank you so much. All right, so we will... Me. Of course, we're delighted to have you both and, and thank you both for taking the time uh, for this important topic to discuss this with us today. So we'll dive right in. Um, so this is a question, I guess, for both of you. Um, at a time when companies are struggling to find talent, how can immigration help fill that gap? And maybe Betsy will start with you on that one. Yes, we know that nationwide and locally, uh, unemployment is very low. And so the need for people in hourly jobs, administrative jobs, professional jobs is very high. And there are so many unfilled jobs. That is a time where it's a really particularly good time to see that immigration um, can solve some of those problems for people that come here, both shorter term and those that are here longer term. 
We find that the uh, posting of jobs through the Mosaic Project, through all of our different chambers, is a really terrific way to reach our ethnic communities, as well as through the International Institute, where they are placing many people in hourly jobs, in all kinds of industries, as well as higher skilled jobs as well, including what we do. Great, and Nalini, same question to you. You know, I think Betsy said it all, actually, after the great resignation, um, I mean, uh, there were, there are so many now va uh, vacancies, and you can see help wanted signs everywhere. I mean, you if you watch Indeed, if you watch Monster, if you watch, look at the St. Louis Post Dispatch, I mean, the help wanted ads in every walk or every kind of occupation is tremendous. So, um, people who have retired have retired and all that experience has gone out of the market so we need people to come forward our our um, u.s population is not growing at the rate that that we can sustain without immigration if we didn't have immigration we would be like japan you know with a very uh, heavy uh, older population and very few young people and the immigrants provide that energy, zest, knowledge, skills, and occupations that the US needs. And they contribute to our banking, insurance, finances. In fact, you know, when you talk about money supply in the economy and the, the real estate, they are, they are the ones who are really powering this forward so we need to welcome immigrants and being an immigrant myself i i, I like to talk about that <laughs> uh, you know three uh, missouri has only 3.8 uh, correct me if i'm wrong betsy 3.8 unemployment rate that is less than structural unemployment i mean so we really need people and so we Great. should be welcoming people here absolutely um, Betsy, question for you. What policy changes can we anticipate with regard to immigration and how will they affect hiring? Well, I think this is an area where there was expectations under President Biden that there would be more changes to open up immigration than what we've actually seen. Um, we have seen um, some broadening of categories, and Eleni will address this as well in, in a deeper way, but some of the things that have been broadened include how certain visas like the O visa can be used with certain categories of um, graduate students, postdocs, and other people proving their outstanding contributions to our country. And another area has to do with uh, the STEM degrees that some of the international mm -hmm. students get. Something that what we find is a lot of our employers do not understand that they can hire international students when they graduate and leave that international student on their student F visa for anywhere from one to three years. And this is something that companies feel, oh, I have to decide immediately if I'm going to do a visa sponsorship. I don't wanna do that, I don't understand it. And the answer is no, you don't. You can hire, particularly interesting for the STEM categories, you can hire an international student graduating in a STEM field um, and they stay on their student visa for three years. And this is something that we have to educate the companies that there's a talent opportunity here that they're not even aware of. Indeed, so. the stressing the importance of education there for sure. And, and I'm sure as Nalini will no doubt let us know um, the regulations change all the time. Nalini, on, along those lines, can you provide some insight on the recent changes as Betsy has alluded to here um, that are improving hiring? So automatic renewals, the H4, the O category, et cetera. Yes, so I mean, um, to take up what, what, what Betsy said uh, on what Betsy said, um, the Biden administration had a huge challenge because the immigration system is like a Titanic. When you want to cha change course, it takes a while to change course. Um, because not only are you contending with the regulations and the memos and the laws and the, and the statutes, but also you're you're now contending with this with with the service um, members who have been now for four years in a particular mode of mind and then you're asking them to collectively do something different so you know i mean for all of us this is a huge big change 
the administration change, administration is trying its best. So some of the new things that they have done, and, and you already alluded to, to both of you alluded to it, was let's just talk about the employment authorization because that is like the biggest um, obstacle to working in the United States. So, um, we, I mean, if you're here and you're in some status in which you're able to work, uh, what was happening was employment authorizations were being delayed, not five months, not six months, but 18, 20 months. So people, you know, weren't able to work, um, you know, uh, I mean, and uh, families weren't able to support themselves. And, you know, this is a big blow to our economy when people cannot work. It's almost like a pandemic in itself. So some of the things that the Biden administration has done, for instance, with H-4s, first it did, if, if you were an H-4 visa, that means you're a dependent of an H-1B visa, and the H-1B visa had I-140 pending and approved, which is the first step in the green card process. Uh, and, and I mean, just to understand the I-140 is the first step because you are probably from a country that is backlogged uh, for the employment visa so that you're able, not able to get the green card right away. So you're still waiting for a, a, number, a number in the green card queue. So your spouse who is now on a dependent H-4 visa was able to get an employment authorization, which uh, two administrations ago was approved. And that would that took about eight, 10, 20 months to get approved. Now automatically 180 days, and they have now made it 540 days. Now the next step is employers have to understand that because they also are very afraid because they have compliance issues with uh, I-9 and E-Verify. And so those systems also had to be brought forward and employers had to be educated on the fact that maybe they have one person on that visa, so they really don't know about this. So we just have to keep beating the drum and telling everybody we know about this constantly, constantly, constantly. Then, of course, there are lots of people with TPS des designations who also can um, uh, apply for um, employment authorization. And I just want you to read the list. I will read out the list because if you, any of our audiences from any of these countries and they're eligible for the, uh, a TPS designation, then they should apply for it. For instance, Afghanistan, Burma, Cameroon, El Salvador, Haiti, Honduras, Nepal, Nicaragua, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, Syria, Ukraine, Venezuela and Yemen. Now, you know, everything I'm saying is on Google. Just Google it and you'll find it. My, like I was ta talking with, you know, both of you, my role here is to give you the 30,000 viewpoint and say, hey, go to these places and look for it. Because, I mean, in our, in our short presentation, that is the best information you can get. And you can go find somebody to represent you or talk to somebody and get some more details that are, you know, particular to your case. So there's also, um, you know, um, also I just want to tell, let everybody know that if you have a, a, a green card that is only two years, only for two years, that means you got it through a family member, your spouse, then you can actually work and your, your employer cannot go be going and re-verifying you in the, uh, your employment status because you are allowed to work. And the only, the only category that is permanent in this country is a green card or permanent residency, work and travel. Everything else is non-immigrant. Every other visa is non-immigrant. Of course, not you. I'm not talking about U.S. citizens, but everything else is non-immigrant. So you need to understand that. That also. Thank so, you, Lini. Some very, very good uh, information there. Um, so moving on to the uh, to the 22 new STEM majors, which were added to the list of qualifying fields for mm -hmm. OPT. Um, Betsy, can you start us off there? What does what does this mean for so, immigrants now? What this means is that. International students in the St. Louis region traditionally has had close to 9,000 international students among all of our universities. About half of them, or slightly more than half, so four or 5,000, are in STEM degree fields. And the difference is that if you're in a non-STEM field, you can stay in the United States and work for a year 
in a job that's related to your major. And that's hard for employers often to think, oh, they can only work for me for a year. Do I want to do that? But for those 5,000 that are in a STEM field, the employer can have them work for literally three years, uh, during which time they might decide to apply for a longer term visa, or even that individual in a STEM field might return to a home country and continue working for a company that has invested and trained them. So there were already a number of STEM qualifying degrees, but what was really important is that this administration has added 22 that if the students understand, and one of the things we learn is often the international students don't understand this when they're picking their major as a freshman and a sophomore, even a junior. And then they go, my gosh, if I had known this, <laughs> I would have chosen a different major yeah. so I could stay and work longer. But I want to show you and read a few of the categories because the, the government added majors in some of our most important new fields, climate change, geospatial, mm -hmm. and data analytics. So yeah. there's another one is on bioenergy, human-centered technology and design cloud computing, an anthrozoology, climate science, earth science, economics and computer science, environmental geoscience, geography and environmental studies, mathematical economics, that was not considered STEM before, mm -hmm. mathematics and atmospheric science, data science, data science general, and data analytics. Now, if you take a one-year graduate degree, in data analytics, that will now allow you to work for one of our companies that needs data analytics skills, and you can stay and work for three years. They have a new one under business analytics, data visualization, financial analytics, data analytics other, industrial and organizational psychology, that now counts as STEM, and even social science research methodology. So if you have a degree in social sciences that helps you design research studies with data as part of it, you will qualify as STEM and can work for three years. And these are the fields that our employers need. So there's a combination now of educating the employers that we have talent for jobs that are currently unfilled and educating the students that if they get this degree, they can now work for at least three years under their student visa while other opportunities could happen for them to work longer for that company. Thanks, Betsy. As as with all things with immigration, it seems uh, it, some updates were definitely needed there, not including mathematics and STEM. So it seems, seems a little crazy. Um, Nalini, same question to you on the, the 22 new STEM majors. So I think it's a fantastic thing that they did because now what it does is that um, I always tell the students when they come to me, you know, exactly what you're talking about. I, we get these answers, but I only got one year. So, you know, you only get one year because really as immigrants, you know, when we come to this country, we are doing so much planning. So we plan how, where we're going to live, how we're going to live, what we're going to study. I just want everybody to think a little further back and think about as soon as you enter high school, what you are going to do with your life. If you're intending to come to the United States, look at what occupations are in demand in the United States. STEM is not going away. So um, uh, some, for instance, some parts of MBA, for instance, don't look obviously STEM, but then universities are also trying to make them STEM. So one of the inquiries that we, students need to do is talk to the university, ask them, are these STEM, uh, is this a STEM related course? You know, maybe the, on the face of it, the name doesn't sound it, but if they have any of these listings that uh, Betsy just called out now, they could be STEM. So go make, you have to research coming to the US. It's not something you do on the spur of the moment because you want to, if you want to live in this country, it requires planning, it requires knowledge, it requires research. And this, all this you can do on your own. All this, you just do informational interviews with a lot of people. I'm telling you so many people are so, are just in, so interested in sharing their knowledge. We have Mosaic Project, oh my God. What a wonderful resource that is for us. People need to know about it. And I talk about it all the time. I mean, in wherever I go, because um, we are very fortunate to have this resource in our, in our midst. Now, when we talk about all these STEM, degree, uh, STEM uh, majors, the fascinating thing about it is, you know, mm -hmm. in school, 
you could even be as a student researcher be involved in federal contracts. And then you could be involved in a PhD program. Um, when you are involved in those two things, it could be, depending on what the area is, you could be eligible for an O visa with a STEM. Now STEM is being allowed in O's, STEM is being allowed in J's. And think about it, O's can work and, you know, there is no cap on O's. There's no cap on J's. The only thing with J's is sometimes you're on a skills list in your home country. So then when you want to change to a green card, you have to get some kind of waiver or a no objection certificate either from, from one of the agencies or you must be, you know, if you're a physician serving in an underserved area, things like that. But, you know, but those are all possibilities you really want to look at especially if you're doing research in this country. And if you're doing it in a, if, you, if you're doing it in COVID or COVID related or any of those mRNA um, disciplines, you, you, I mean, you can also go in for what is called a national interest waiver. That means if you're being employed and you, uh, you, you're in the employment second preference category, um, you, instead of going for permanent labor certification, you can go for a national interest waiver, which means that you are, you are, whatever you're doing is so important to this country. We don't want you to wait a, for a very long time for that labor certification. And, you know, and it, especially if you're working on federal contracts, supporting federal contracts, you know, or your research in an area which is vitally important, yes. And it's, you're supporting any COVID efforts, pandemic efforts. Now we have monkeypox. That might be something also that, you know, it, it may even be public health related and it's, you know, it's number crunching in the public health area. Go find out if it's a STEM degree and fits in any of the new categories. And, you know, please go, to, go do that. So research is important. I think that's why these 22 more STEM uh, areas was so important. It lends itself not, in, not only to the F visa, but O visas, J visas, you know, of course, H and maybe even L's, it all depends. Oh. Yeah, I was gonna build on that and just say, I know there's a question about educating the companies. Um, yes. And that's something that we at the Mosaic Project, um, we have a bastard companies and we have an opportunity to potentially convene and do a better job as a region to educate the companies uh, now that we have these new opportunities for more categories. So I, I think this is something that now that we're coming through the pandemic and companies are looking at filling talent that we as a region could do better education of our companies. And we are trying to determine the best way to do that because that would make a difference. May I say something about the OPTs? Um, so suppose you come and do a U.S. bachelor's degree and uh, you can get an OPT then. You do a master's degree, you can get an OPT then. You do a PhD, you can get an OPT then. So, I mean, just think about it. You have three opportunities to do OPTs. And if they're in the STEM area, think how these will all add up. I mean, just think about it. Also talk to your uh, uh, educational institution about maybe doing some kind of curricular practical training during your uh, do, while you are studying um, that will eat into some of the OPT depending on how it is being used but that's something make friends with the DSO in your university oh my god that is the best resource as a student you know so one yeah. it's the side of the student and the designated officer at the university yeah. but then there's really the other side which is educating the employers Yes. about what the talent we have and how they find it. And so there's the two sides of this coin and all of the parts of our country have not done um, the best on that. And I do think St. Louis has an opportunity to do better. Absolutely, so I'll, absolutely. I'll just add, Nalini, I, I so agree. Um, I would have loved to have had Mosaic here when I arrived back in 2003. So uh, <laughs> Mosaic is a, is a wonderful resource because it really pulls all of that, all of that information together. Yeah. We do have some questions coming in. So I'm going to, I think Betsy, you may have kind of addressed the first mm -hmm. one there. Um, a question also from Lisa, can those international students who are working in STEM for three years also apply for themselves as an exceptional person visa? And I think you touched a bit on that, Nalini, but if you wanted to, to take that one. It depends on what, you, what they're doing and how they can. Um, it's very fact specific. 
And so, um, uh, I mean, yes, you can. The short answer is yes, you can. And it's very fact specific. So um, I would highly recommend going and talking to somebody who has done this before and talking to them and see how you can qualify. Um, one of the things I would say is, if you're going to be exceptional, then you need to show you're exceptional. So because exceptional okay. is really, I mean, in the, your, you, I mean, uh, I will call it Nobel light so that, you know, you have to have publications, <laughs> peer reviewed, you have to have the, everybody saying, yay, add a boy, add a girl, you know, that's mm -hmm. kind of what you need. And if you think you're that, then yes. But if you're just a, just a PhD, and you do, having patents, that's the other thing, um, you know, uh, in the areas. And so those all add, add up. But if you're, you're, if you're a PhD without publications, I would, if your goal is to stay in this country, okay, let's just go back to that. If your goal is to stay in this country, get employment, ask your employer to sponsor you, have that conversation, go that route. Sometimes it is harder uh, it's not impossible. It's harder sometimes, a heavier lift. I, I, don't, I think I'm, the harder is a wrong word. Heavier lift when you are trying to do it on your own. Take all the support you can get. That's, what, that's my recommendation, really. Good advice. Just, Sorry, Nilini, go ahead. Did you have something to add? Yeah, I want, also want to talk about other visas such as TN visas. Um, because we are, I mean, our neighbors, North and South, we have this fantastic treaty with both of them. And so, you know, I mean, as an alternative to H-1B, every time H-1B gets over, I have the conversation about TN. So, you know, if you are qualified in one of the occupations in the treaty, um, uh, you, U.S., um, MCA treaty, I always get it, get this wrong now. Um, yeah, there's a list of occupations there and mostly the, and you have to stick to those occupations. You have to actually do the work. Supervisory work is hmm, difficult to get through on that. So um, I, I'm not making a blanket statement, but just a caveat. So, I mean, uh, follow the uh, instructions on how to apply your either Mexico mm -hmm. or Canada. It's slightly different in both countries, but those are not capped. And if you are, it's a, there's, if you have employment here and you are a citizen of Canada or Mexico, consider that as an alternative. Um, it can be renewed indefinitely. Um, one of the things I also want to throw in there is about spouses. Not all spouses can work. So some spouses can work, uh, you know, spouses of else can work. Spouses of uh, spouse of H one Bs in certain circumstances we said before can work. Student spouses cannot work. Um, you know, uh, T N spouses cannot work. You know, but now they've uh, oh, Betsy, we need to talk about investors and treaty traders, and E one E twos. Those people can work. Both husband, uh, both spouses can work and apply. Um, uh, and uh, they have loosened all the EAD requirements on those spouses. Uh, Australian nationals, they have a special 10,000 visas for them, E3 visas. Um, and then uh, Chile, Singapore, uh, they have about uh, 5,400 and 1,400 visas, H1B visas for them as well. So, you know, I mean, H1B1 visas. Uh, fashion models, all those people. I mean, so there are particular, if you are from a different country, I mean, do, especially these countries that I mentioned, please go ahead. E1, T, E2, treaty trader, treaty investor visas. Those are for people who want to do trade with the United States or, you know, uh, want to open a, 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 a company which is majority owned by their nationality. Um, they can indefinitely live in this country. It's, you know, keep renewing the visa and indefinitely live here. So those are all good options for working here, living here, working Thanks. here. Thanks, Nalini. I know our, uh, our FDI director, Sean Mullins, would be glad that you, uh, you gave a little plug there for the FDI side. Um, just a few comments that are coming in. And Betsy, thank you. I think you're answering some of these live. Um, a comment from Kristen. Thank you. I think international students seem fairly aware of OPT and academic training. Sadly, the harder part is breaking into the job market. So we're excited to learn that you are brainstorming that. So more of a comment from Kristen. Thank you for that. Um, and then from Dave, are there any special visa considerations for individuals who engage in a DOL training program such as Job Corps? 
Uh, it, it all depends on what, I mean, you, in general, most employment requires uh, company sponsorship, employer sponsorship. Um, I mean, uh, I mean, there are, if you're an individual who can find family sponsorship, then, you know, if you have a relative who can sponsor you, then you can get employment through that category too. And let's not forget that because the U.S. immigration system is actually slanted towards family immigration more than employment immigration. So that's that's something we, unlike our neighbor to the north, you know, that's some, and we are trying to get there to be more employment friendly, but you know, that let's not forget those those categories as well. And I have to give a plug for that category as I fell into that myself. So, <laughs> so thanks for mentioning that. All right, and, uh, and Betsy, thanks for um, sharing some information there. We just had a question on a presentation to education employers. So Betsy has provided some information there as well. All right, so uh, Betsy, what are some of the pros and cons of hiring and retaining foreign born professionals? Well, we see through our professional connector program about two people a week that reach out to the Mosaic Project who are international work authorized in St. Louis and are looking to connect to employers. Um, so that's one source of people that are looking and we connect them to companies and uh, inter international people and local people that are in their field. What we see is that you know, when you have foreign born people as part of your organization, your nonprofit, your corporation, your university, you know, they're bringing a global perspective, which is needed today more than ever. They often are bringing a different outlook they may have had different training, different skills. And we also are seeing a more direct tie into two things. One, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and talent attraction. So for example, um, we helped a young man from Afghanistan get hired at the Ritz-Carlton as an accounting person. And so not only did his skills work at the Ritz-Carlton for their field, but the Ritz-Carlton is hoping by having him be in their talent pool that he will encourage other people in our Afghan community to apply to the Ritz-Carlton because he's having a good experience there. So not only is it the individual with what they bring, but people bring a depth of talent and others that can fill jobs in today's market that is really a needed source of a pipeline of people. So I think that's a really important aspect about why the uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, the employee resource groups that are now blossoming within companies. So Leadership can be developed by various ethnic groups. You have leadership, and then you have networks back into communities that you either are selling to, that you're serving, or that will be a source of talent. Great, thanks, Betsy. And those networks so important, we know, especially for, for our own region. I know from listening to you, Betsy, and the Mosaic team, that those networks are so important for getting that word of mouth out um, so that if people have a good experience, they're encouraging others then to, to come to the region as well. Um, Nalini, what are some of the advantages and the risks associated with hiring employees with employment authorization documents, temporary protected status, and other maybe atypical forms of, of employment authorization? So, um, if somebody has an employment authorization, it depends on how they've got, how they've received it. If it's through fam, if, they, if it's through a family. Uh, application that employment authorization can be renewed several times um, you know and that and actually that's no cost to the employer and that that can go on for quite a while and you know if you have refugees asylees they can apply for employment authorization and especially the refugees are work work ready incident to status so that's a wonderful thing um, uh, uh, the other TPS, so it depends on the country. Sometimes, for instance, I do, don't know if you remember, remember or not, uh, Haiti went in and out of TPS status. There's some other countries that, because TPS really depends on the country conditions and how, how the federal government views country conditions, whether they have, you know, become better or they become worse, uh, you know, um, so, for instance, South Sudan, I think it's that is going to go on for a while. It's been that condition has been there for the last, I think, 20 years or so. I don't think that's going to change. So, you know, um, you know, Venezuela, you know, those are, I mean, I'm only calling out a couple of countries because, I mean, it, it's all, you, 
go read the Department of State website for the country conditions, and these will give you very good insight into whether these are going to continue. Uh, and if they continue, then then you know, uh, uh, then you know, employment uh, authorization will continue for these people. Um, and the other, other, you know, other, uh, um, other uh, EADs that are there with, you know, dependent visas. Um, the only thing I can say is this administration has has made it easy for H4s, L2, E, E3s. It has designated given spousal designations for dependents of certain visas, and these are actually put on the I-94 as they enter the country. So then it's easy to identify these people and to say, okay, these people can work incident to status, and the employers should not be afraid to, you know. Uh, and most of these statuses will go on as long as the principal immigrant has the has the immigrant visa. So, so that that is also you know I mean for instance L's can go on for five to seven years. I mean H's can go on for twenty years, maybe even more. You know I mean I mean E one E twos E E one E twos E threes they can go on for a very long time. So. Um, uh, I uh, I, th I think the way I would approach it is I as immigrant it's my duty to keep I want to keep my job right so let me educate my employer and tell them exactly what the situation is be honest and upfront credibility is huge 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 I mean I know a lot of employers are afraid to hire immigrants please as an immigrant please make it easy for your employer to hire you because you say these are the resources I can bring to the table. You know, somebody whom you can talk to, suppose you know an immigration attorney, talk to them, you know Mosaic, talk to them. Mosaic has a lot of free resources. You don't even have to speak to an immigration attorney sometimes. They can give you enough information for you to educate the employer. And that's a great thing. the employer can be very comfortable talking to these people. Yes, right? Thank you. So, sorry, Nalini. Um, no, no, no. That's a great segue. I was just going to say into into our next questions, which is how can foreign nationals set themselves apart to be considered stronger candidates for employers? So, um, Betsy, perhaps we'll we'll let you uh, start us off there, seeing as you literally wrote the book, as it were. Uh, yes, <laughs> did. Um, I did write the book. Welcome to the USA. You're hired a guide for foreign born people seeking jobs. I think what's important is that um, the talent understands the values of the company and they understand what they can contribute, um, both in terms of the immediate talent needs, but also in a bigger sense. What can they contribute to the strategy? What can they contribute to the employee resource groups? What can they contribute to how the company might have bigger visions of what they can do? So at first it's doing the job at hand, but it's also showing that you can bring some broader skills and insights and knowledge that may be a bit different than they're going to get from a, a US born candidate. And so I think that that's a strength, but you also have to show that you understand the way of doing business in the United States. You have to be likable and friendly and know how to do the job that you say you will do, but bring a little bit of that uniqueness and flair to the table because you have something that's special. And employers need to know that and appreciate that you bring something different. And a lot of our employers, um, they are seeking that. And some of them because they have customers and clients that are international. Some of them because they have a humanitarian bent and they want to help make the St. Louis region better by having a more diverse workforce and having us attract and retain international people. And also some of them really want to hire some of our newer Afghan and ultimately Ukrainian people because they, again, want us to be a growing positive region and there's a real commitment to that great thanks so much betsy and uh, nalini same question to you although i know you alluded to this already in your your last comment yeah i mean you know um i i think it's up to us to alleviate employer fears as an immigrant um you know uh, i mean do do a, uh, an exercise in pros and cons go prepared to answer that question and how you know how you can alleviate the burden of filing an immigrant application or being getting the ad especially if you're a student the employer doesn't have to do anything 
you know, basically they have to be an e-verify employer. That's important. But, and, and the student has to work in the area in which they have studied. So the academics has to ma match the job duties. But, you know, students can work for a couple of employers. Uh, you know, they can, you know, do things that are related to their own field. And, uh, and so, I mean, that's kind of the important thing that we say, you know, make it easier for them. I mean, I mean, Betsy's already talked about all the list of things that are important to an employer. As an employer myself, uh, I want to know that you are bringing the attitude of can do. You can't go buy that in the store, you know. Very, very good advice indeed, very good advice. A few um, other questions that are popping up and just a reminder, if you have questions, please pose those in the Q&A and uh, we love the engagement, so thank you for that. Um, Zalipa has a question, how can a small business qualify to bring in emigrant employees through a work visa? Nalini, perhaps we'll table that one for you. Okay, um, so um, it depends on what kind of work you have. And I, as I said before, you know, um, if and which country they're coming from, you look at the country visas because those can you can apply for them at any time. If your target, uh, oh, you can also go and employ uh, students, you know, to work, you know, and give them the opportunity to gain experience with you. Uh, that's another op uh, option. If final option, I would say as a last resort, go to the H-1Bs. H-1Bs require employers to have the financial capacity, not only to pay the current employees and their overhead, but also the future employee that you're, you're going to hire. And if you are cap subject, then this can only be started in March of every year. So if you're picked up in the lottery, you can make the full application, otherwise you cannot. Um, I've known, I mean, just think to keep in mind, immigration even looks at the number of parking spots you may have. If you say they're going to work in your office, uh, how many, do you have a sufficient parking, enough computers, desk space, office space? So, um, so if you are, um, the but parameters again, of work are important. I'm going to say Nalini working. though, Nalini, mm. um, you know, the way our immigration system works, you know, if, if you decided tomorrow, you personally wanted to hire a specific person coming from Brazil or a specific person coming from Nigeria, our system doesn't make that very easy for you to determine that you want to bring an international person directly in. Yes, you, you are correct. So, um, so, I mean, I always get the, get the question is, I have this employee I have identified in India or China or one of those countries where the way, queue is 20 years long. Uh, <laughs> and I say, uh, try, to, uh, try to look at people from those countries over here already, H4 visas with VADs. L2s with EADs. Look at all those people who already have the EADs in our country. They are plug and play employees. Or if yeah. you have a subsidiary of your company that's in another country that yes. you've established or that is established in that country, you might be able to make a lateral L visa. But again, just to say you want to hire a person you know from another country and bring them here, our system does not allow that. Like, it just doesn't work very well. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, because especially, I mean, we have to prove that there are no willing workers, available workers sure. here to work for that. And, you know, there's a reason for that, right? Although now, right now, it doesn't make sense, but, you know, if there's a yeah. recession, well, what would there's make, definitely It would be reason, more right? sense if we had low unemployment, like we do now, that yeah. you could bring in more immigrants. And if we had high unemployment, you take the number down. Those would be logical. But since we don't have logic in the uh, immigration system, we just have to live with the numbers we have, even though unemployment is so low. Yes. You know, once upon a time, H-1Bs, they did allow it to go up and down with the with the size of the economy, but they did away with that. Uh, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of fear about my immigrants are going to take my job. They won't. Look at me. I mean, look at all of us who are immigrants who are employing other people. Immigrants, by and large, open their own businesses and employ local people. So. All right. Thank you, ladies. Um, another question from Susan. How many opportunities of OPT or CPT will be given to international students? It's kind of a specific one, but Betsy, do you want to? attempt that one? Well, 
each student has his or her own opportunity to use optional practical training um, and their curricular practical training. So each student has that opportunity for the certain number of months authorized by the university. The only difference being, um, as Nalini said, depending on which degree you have, it opened up more opportunity. And then if you have a STEM certified major from your university, that gives you more years. But um, there are, you know, there, there's no short, every student has that opportunity to take advantage of using their F visa to work under optional practical training and curricular practical training. So I hope that answers it. I don't know about what else that means about how many opportunities. Um, I, may I suggest that they go to the careers um, uh, place, you know, what I'm, why am I blanking out? Career office, right? Um, and they maybe they have opportunities there that they can go and talk to somebody. But, you know, it, opportunity is actually what you make of it. Network, please. <laughs> make lots of friends everywhere. And perhaps I'm just, I'm, and I'm just guessing here, Betsy, um, perhaps there is a, so perhaps part of the question is, you know, is there, can you apply for a second OPT? You know, is it a, is it a series or is it a one-time one time thing? I'll let Nalini answer that because it, it is a series per se, but, and there's a limited sure. time, but Nalini, maybe you can give a better fact on the CPT, OPT exact timing. So um, after, uh, I'm, uh, I think, as I said before, you can apply for OPT at every degree level, but if you go for a second master's, I don't think you can get an OPT. Um, so um, that that's why I said planning is very important. Talk to the DSO who will help you through the system and identify the opportunities and what you can exactly do with your particular degree. Um, you know, um, so th that's something you really want to work on um, uh, as a plan. So that will help you plan your like your, the academic studies as well as your work life. And sometimes you don't get OPT, so you can fall out of status. You don't get, I mean, you don't get the opportunity to work with an employer. That can happen. Mm -hmm. So, so be prepared. Yeah, I, gotta, I, yes. gotta call, I got a call this week from somebody who wanted to hire an international student, but they wanted to hire them in an hourly job that had nothing to do with their major. And, mm. and I'm like, it has to be approved by the university and it has to be related to the major. You can't hire them to work the cash register, even though it's a job and call that OPT when they were a major in science or you know in engineering or whatever, just because you want to hire the person. But sure. it does directly have to relate to their major. Right, yeah. Good advice. Um, Betsy, we're gonna stay with you for just a moment um, and talk a little bit about, about the Mosaic Project, which of course we've been talking about throughout, but um, mm -hmm. what role does the Mosaic Project play with regard to hiring and sourcing professional and international STEM students' resumes for companies? And I know you've started a, a kind of new initiative as well along, along those lines. Yeah, so we, are, we had tried in the past to do a job fair for international STEM students with employers, but um, it was before the pandemic, but it, it's, it's hard because one of the issues, um, as Nalini said, is an employer has to really want to do a little bit extra to um, bring in an international student. So they have to really think that that student is irresistible is the word we use. You know, you have to, that the student, the international student or any person trying to be hired who's international has to be so smart and charming and win over that employer that they're willing to do some extra work maybe have a few extra thousand dollars, maybe get an immigration lawyer. They have to really want you. And it's not just a matter of walking up at a career fair and talking to someone from the talent team or the HR team. You know, you really have to build relationships and find people. And so I think, you know, we're gonna be working more directly with some of the uh, university people to recommend some of their top STEM students, help them make some relationships more directly with potentially hiring organizations. And, and we're playing with the idea of something even like a reverse job fair, where essentially, you know, you've got the fabulous talent that we then bring some employers directly to them. So this is something that uh, Suzanne Sierra, Annie Mabale, all of us on our Mosaic team, we are uh, looking at some resources, we're talking to people. And again, if you have ideas about how we can help make this a richer, better dynamic, we would be very interested in your thoughts.
Great. Thanks so much, Betsy. Always, uh, always looking for the, the new things and new ways to, to fill those gaps. So we really uh, appreciate that. Nalini, can you talk to us a little bit about the costs, the obligations, maybe the risks associated with petitioning um, for an employee's visa? So there are a few things that uh, I think let's start from the employer side first. The employer must identify the job and the job duties associated with that job. So a lot of employers, if you're smaller, even larger employees sometimes don't have job descriptions. So some of these job descriptions need to be what I call immigration friendly. So um, uh, mirror some of the language that is already on the DOL websites and on the uh, on the job descriptions that are there on the on those uh, on the on the on the websites. That's one. Secondly, they must be able to have the financial uh, wherewithal to be able to not only support their current employers but also future employers. Now the future immigrant employ employee must be paid at a level that is uh, prescribed by the U.S. Department of Labor. And this is available on their website. It's all, uh, if you just Google the, you know, a job description or a job name, you'll be able to get a whole list of uh, um, places. And that wages are tied to a, me a metropolitan area. So you have to, so New York, of course, wages will be different from St. Louis and St. Louis will be different from rural Missouri, that kind of thing. So it, it's very tailored to job, job duties, amount of experience, level of education. So the, even the wages are different, uh, are of different categories of different levels. Um, I would say um, uh, on a very broad way, um, level two wages probably will is, because for instance, if you're saying, uh, uh, talking about a bachelor's with no experience whatsoever, then you can give them a minimum entry wage. But if you are talking to a master's and the master's is supposed to have really mastered their craft and their art, and they need much less direction, they're probably little more of a plug and play employee. And so for them, you may have to pay more. And that would be, I would call a level two wage. Um, it depends on the experience, uh, you know. Um, I mean, for instance, um, I just want to talk about one of the recent ones we did for a, a, a logistics manager who had worked on a J visa for a certain employer, and then the employer wanted her to come back. And, uh, you know, she had, I mean, she was superbly uh, qualified. So of course we had tried for an H1B and of course we, we she was lucky she got it, she got in. And uh, we told them that the amount of wages that they, they were willing to pay was not insufficient. It had to be higher because first she had the six years with them and she was educationally qualified, you know, so they were willing. So, you know, Sometimes immigration attorneys are on your side and they can help both the employer and employee navigate that as well. That's, that's the employer side of it. On the employee side of it, they have to have a very good resume that shows exactly who all they work for, what they worked as, what were the job duties, what are the tools they used in that, in that particular um, uh, field of any, uh, uh, job, uh, what they worked and used in the job, like the, everybody uses software of some kind or the other, you know, and uh, their prior job experience, even if it's foreign, some of it is uh, applicable in the US, not all of it maybe, but some of it is, if you have a foreign degree, get a, get a equivalency, US equivalency, go, go to a, you know, the, go to a, uh, agency that does that, uh, you know, uh, you know, translates a foreign degree into the U equivalent U.S. degree. So all that do that kind of homework up front, um, and you know, um, identify the particular skills you bring to the table, which are related to your area of study and the job duties that the employer has. So from the employee side, research the job research the employer before you apply. So you can do some of this work ahead of time. So coming back to that preparation again, it seems, yes. to, be our, seems yes. to be our theme today. Yes, indeed, great advice. Um, so we are getting closer to the hour here. So just uh, very quickly, perhaps we'll, we'll punt this one over to you, Betsy. Can you provide an update on Afghans being hired in St. Louis and the outlook for Ukrainian arrivals? 
Yes, so the International Institute of St. Louis is our only resettlement agency. They have resettled close to 700 Afghan people, which is divided into 184 family units. Uh, as of last week, they said about 174 jobs have been found. So almost all the families have equivalently have almost have a, somebody who has a job. Um, if the people don't speak English, which is almost all of the Afghan people who have come, they're not speaking English yet. They are more likely to start in various packaging warehouse hourly jobs or with hospitals, casinos, restaurants, um, hotels. But the Mosaic Project um, has worked with seven of the Afghans who did have good English skills, good job skills, and they are now in professional jobs. Uh, so we are going to start seeing more. You may have seen publicity this week that a family came um, this week uh, from Afghanistan through Albania, and there's optimism mm. that maybe another 380 mm. people divided into families will be coming. And again, um, the best place for tapping into that uh, talent source is through the International Institute on their website at iistl.org. Uh, you can find under services, they have a workforce. They have a team of people that match employers with those people seeking jobs. We've only had a few Ukrainian people come so far, um, just a handful into the region. They are coming via private sponsorship, not through the International Institute. So they are dispersed in the region. Uh, the issue for them is they're waiting for their employee, uh, their employment authorization document, EAD, and there's a backlog because obviously all the uh, US immigration people are busy doing all the other um, documents that Nalini was talking to. And now all of a sudden the Ukrainians are in line to get employment documentation. And so some of them have been lagged and they can't yet start looking for jobs because they're waiting for that employment document. But we will see a growing number, but it's very small in the region right now. Thank you. Great, Nalini, anything to add on, on those lines? Um, for Afghans overseas, uh, the, US, uh, the US government is trying to make it easier for them to apply, simplify the process. I think the same thing for Iraqis who are also involved in our war effort. Um, Ukrainians, there's a page on uscis.gov, you for you. And there is a whole myriad of sources on that. I was told there's also a Facebook page. This is being run by somebody who, who is excellent at what they're doing. So please go on Facebook and look for that as well. A lot of the um, consulates are very uh, active on Twitter and Facebook. So, um, I, I mean, this is the way I read it. I, I mean, that, you know, like any big organization, it's harder to update your website, but it's easier to put out information on Twitter and Facebook because that is not so not so compliance driven. So, you know, so I, I think that please, as an immigrant, look at those uh, as well. Um, and also there are, I mean, there are construction industries looking for people, oh my gosh. So if people who don't have language skills, but you have the ability to work construction in any capacity, please contact, uh, you know, a lot of, we have a lot of federal dollars now floating in the, in, in St. Louis uh, region where, you know, it needs people to work on. So that's, that's the other thing I'd talk about. Fantastic. Well, thank you both so much, Betsy and Alini, for a very informative session. I feel like we could uh, we could go on and on <laughs> with both of you. Such a crucial topic for, for both our own region and really the nation as a whole. So, so thank you both so much. Thank and you. thank you to our attendees for taking time to join us today as well. Don't forget to join us next month for another event in the Engage and Trade series on Thursday, August 25th, when we will be bringing you a global economic outlook with JP Morgan Chase. So stay tuned for details of that coming to your inbox soon and uh so in the interim stay safe take care and i should probably add stay dry with this uh, showery weather that we're having here in the region take care and thanks again thank you stella thank, thank you, you betsy you for including me great job thank bye -bye. you bye bye